Hello everyone, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains in Missouri, USA. Today, we're going to take a look at using an Arduino Mega to test these funny little static RAM modules from a TRS-80 Model 100. While the test we're building is for a specific purpose, the same ideas can be used to test many different types of vintage ICs. So think of this as a specific example of a general idea. Well, how's all this going to work? Let's jump in and find out. Thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this episode. Whether you need a small, simple board like this or a larger, more complicated design, head on over to PCBWay.com, click on PCB Instant Quote, upload your files, and select from the plethora of options available. PCBWay offers a wide range of products and services, including assembly, stencils, and PCB design. When you have a need for circuit boards, head on over to PCBWay.com and give them a try. About a year ago, I picked up some RCA1802 microprocessors and I needed a way to test them while waiting for other components to arrive. I had an Arduino Mega laying around, so I whipped up a testing rig on a breadboard. The Mega acted as a system RAM, ROM, etc. and this worked well enough to be able to run machine code on the 1802s and test their functionality. This let me find two bad ones out of the lot of 10. The RCA1802 tester soon morphed into the idea for a DRAM tester for old single bit DRAMs such as the 4116 and 4164. To test the 4116 you need plus and minus 5 volts and plus 12 volts so I added a couple of DC to DC converters which had remote start capability and I also added a TVS diode array so when the 4116s have shorted power rails they don't blow up your Arduino. And that worked quite well and I was happy but that idea also morphed. And soon I had this generic component tester which had another TVS diode array, some user interface buttons, an OLED, and a generic connector, which you could connect a pod on uh, to test various types of ICs that would have the right pinout. So you might have a pod for DRM modules and a pod for some other type of chip, etc. And I fiddled with this idea for months and never got it quite to where I wanted it to be. And so I took the ideas out of the DRAM tester and component tester and I made this static RAM module tester for the TRS-80 Model 100 RAM modules. And you can see it's the same basic idea. We have our Mega here, our OLED, the DC to DC converter, three push buttons, and our static RAM module. And I threw in this little LED here so we can have it blink and do things during testing. The very first Model 100 I worked on about two and a half years ago had a bad RAM module and it was very difficult to find because it kept it from booting. I have that module and a few other bad modules that I found on machines I've worked on recently. It's not uncommon for them to fail and I wanted a way to find out which individual chip on these modules had failed. So here is the target of our efforts the TRS-80 Model 100 RAM module. When Kyocera designed the M100, they only built an 8KF static RAM. This kept the cost down as RAM was expensive back then, but they also wanted to allow for an easy way for the owner to upgrade the amount of RAM. To keep the power consumption minimized, so the memory backup battery would last weeks between uses, they used some very low power surface mount SRAM chips. The individual chips are 2K each, and they mounted for them on a unique ceramic substrate which has all the traces run internally and it has an odd 0.7 inch row spacing. The 28 pin modules were designed to plug into RAM expansion sockets on the main PCB and the computer would automatically detect them. The RAM chips themselves have two separate chip enable pins. Both pins must be pulled low to select the chip. On the RAM modules, 
all four chips have one chip enabled pin in common. They're all wired together to one pin on the module. The other four chip enabled pins, one for each chip, go to separate pins on the module. To select an individual chip, you must pull the global chip enable pin low, as well as the individual chip enable pin for that chip. To access 8K of address space requires 13 address lines, but we only have 11 address pins on each RAM chip. What we need to do is to enable each chip by its unique chip enable pin when its address range is being accessed. The M100 does this with hardware. A few chips serve as address decoders and select the correct RAM chip based on the address. The construction of the test rig is rather simple, an Arduino Mega and a breadboard. The Mega was chosen and it is common, low cost, has 5 volt I.O., abundant memory space, and, well, I had one. The power and switches are connected with solid wires cut to length. The connections between the Mega and the memory module was done with male-to-male -male DuPont wires. While the multicolored DuPont wires are convenient, the connections are tenuous at best, but they are quick for knocking a project up. The use of a plus and minus 5 volt DC to DC converter was retained from the original DRAM tester, which can accept an input power from 4.5 to 9 volts DC. This gives the device under test its own power source that has a remote on-off and current limiting built in. The OLED is a standard I2C model, and three push buttons are used for user input, which from left to right are up, down, and select. Because the memory modules have ICs mounted on the bottom of the PCB, combined with relatively short legs, single row female pin headers are used as spacers. This makes inserting and removing a module a bit of a pain due to the headers and it needing to stink it out from between the DuPont wires. The LED was added to show the functionality of an interrupt service routine on the Arduino. I'm using the free version of Visual Studio with an add-on called Visual Micro, but you could also use the standard Arduino IDE if you prefer. While Visual Micro is not free, it works very well and allows me to make the most of the limited time I have for such projects. The software framework was borrowed from the earlier DRAM tester. The general ideas used for each test are the same, but the implementation on a multi-bit RAM is different than a single-bit DRAM, like the 4164. The main subsections of the software are as follows. The first time a piece of software runs, there are always some housekeeping duties to take care of. This is where we set up things like initializing variables, setting the standby configuration of the Arduino Mega I.O., and configuring the OLED screen, etc. For the user interface, we make use of the Arduino loop function to run the user interface. The UI is a simple menu system that makes use of the OLED and the three push buttons. In the file all underscore defs.h, we have an enumeration that describes all the possible states of the user interface. These include Splash, which displays a small splash screen for a few seconds. Begin, which displays the list of possible tests we can run and puts a marker beside the current selection. Select lets the user change the selected test. If the selection has changed, the state is set back to begin so we can redraw the screen. If the select button is pressed, the state is changed to times. Times lets the user select the number of times this test will be run. The user can use the up down buttons to change the number. The select button is used to change the state to test. Test calculates the starting address and the number of bytes to be tested based on the test selected and calls do test to begin the testing process. When the tests are complete, the state is set to continue. Continue pauses the display to show the test results. Pressing any key will change the state to again. Again lets the user choose to run the same test again with the same number of reps or to go back to the beginning. We call do test to begin the testing procedure. It in turn calls the individual testing functions. The first thing it does is initialize the I.O. of the Arduino to the proper state to begin testing, and then it turns the 5 volts on and institute a 2 second delay to make sure the 5 volts has had time to come up. It will zero out the chip failure counters and it will run each type of test with different parameters. And finally it will display a 
passed or failed message along with the chip number of any chips that have failed test. And it'll end by turning off the 5 volts and changing the I.O. of the Arduino back to standby mode. The run test function fills an entire address range with a given pattern and then tries to read that pattern back. If it does not read the pattern back from the given address, an error is logged. As a demonstration, the hexed values of 55 and AA are used. These provide alternating bit patterns. This type of test is not very useful. It can only tell you if any memory that is addressable can hold a bit pattern. It will miss any addressing faults on the chip itself. The walk test is a simplistic take on a march test. It first tries to fill all of memory with a pattern, and then it walks through each address one at a time, looks to see if it is indeed set to the fill pattern, and if it is, it will try to set it to the complement of that pattern. The address is read from again to ensure that the complemented data was read back. This type of test ensures that we can reach every address and that each bit at each address can be set to both 1 and 0. These simple tests are adequate for testing single chips or for simple modules like this. If you're writing a memory test to run on an actual computer, you would also need to worry about faults within the address decoding logic on the computer itself, and more sophisticated methods would be called for. When I originally designed the DRAM tester, I had tried using different models of Arduinos, so the functions that do all the bit twiddling were abstracted into a separate file and called as inline functions from the main.ino file. This made it easier to swap Arduinos, as only a different .h for each board type needed to be included. I've retained that idea here, as it also helps to create a clean abstraction between the different parts of code needed to twiddle bits in hardware and the parts of the code that are the actual testing logic. It's a crude how, a hardware abstraction layer. It's not perfect though, as the code that deals with configuring the part of the Arduino used for the user interface is still done in the main file. This also has the side effect of making it easier to possibly port the project to a different platform if someone wanted to. Probably the best example of all the bit twiddling needed is the set address function. We have to take the first eight address bits, that is 0 through 7, and send them to port A, and then we need to calculate which RAM chip should be enabled. After we do that, we have to flip all those chip enable bits because they're active low, and then we also need to shift over the A8 through A10 address bits into the correct place, and OR it all together to write that out to port C. I'm choosing to use port functions on the Arduino rather than individual pin access because with all this bit twiddling we're doing, port access is much faster. While we get a pass-fail type indication on the OLED, this might not always be enough information, so we have the ability to set the software to a verbose mode and do a serial dump of every failure. This functionality was broken out into a separate function so that it can be called by any test method. It counts individual failures by chip according to the address, and can also send this out to the serial port. If there are a lot of failures, this will slow things down a lot, however. From the failure dump, you can determine things like a single chip acting like an address line is stuck. There are times, however, where you may want to customize the reporting to narrow down on just a narrow range of failures. We'll look at such a case in a bit. In the original DRAM tester, I used an interrupt service routine, an ISR, to automatically send the DRAM refresh signals. It also served double duty to flash an LED when the unit was running test. I kept the ISR and LED flashing as it is a good demonstration of using an ISR. A good future modification to the code base would be to move the button reading code into the ISR rather than rely on the Arduino's loop function. However, Whatever is in the ISR needs to be small and fast. Well, enough with all this theory of operation. What do you say we test a module and see what happens? Well, I've got the green flashing LED on this side. I'll kind of cut my hand over it like this so you can see it. And then we'll start a test. And for this test, I am going to tell it to select all, but we could also scroll down and select an individual module. And the buttons will let you scroll all the way through, back and forth. So we'll say select, or uh, we'll select test all. Press select. One repetition. And now you can see our LED is blinking. And it's giving us the results. 
and all the numbers are in hexadecimal by the way and you can see it tells us that chip c1 had a failure and if we want to double check that you can say no we don't want to do it again we can select test just chip c1 select one rep and now we're going to do the simple fill test and you see one had some errors and the other didn't and the walk test both come up with errors so yeah there's definitely some errors there on c1 but what if we're curious about what those errors are well what we can do is uh, set the verbose mode in the software and recompile it and download it to the arduino and take a look at the serial output let's try that now I have changed the verbose mode to true and I will click the button here to recompile it which it did and we'll now shoot that over to the Arduino and to reset it and we're going to go ahead and tell it just to test C1 because we know that's where the error is this time we're going to get a lot of uh, information out over the serial port so it'll take a little longer Oh yes, one rep. Oh yeah, I see the, the walking test finds a lot more errors. And if we scroll through this data that we got in the serial dump, we really don't see any easily definable patterns in either the address or the data read back. So I'm guessing this chip is just pretty well knackered. Um, there's not much we can discern about what the internal failure was. Here we have a different module. I've turned verbose mode off, so we're not slowed down. And we'll go ahead and run a test on all four chips, and we'll see what it says. Oh, picking up failures even with the simple fill test. And it says chips two and three have failures. What happens if we test those individually? So let's test chip two individually. Hmm, that's interesting. Chip two is passing. Okay, let's test chip three individually. Oh, yeah, there's definitely some errors on chip 3. But why did we get it, that error on chip 2 when we tested all of them together, but no failure shown when we tested it separately? That puzzled me for quite a while. Now I have changed the code, so we only get the verbose output for failures on chip 2. So we'll go ahead and do a test all again. And we'll see what type of information we get from the serial port. Interesting. It still tells us that chip 2 and chip 3 have failed. If we look at the serial dump, we see that the failure is only with the first few addresses after shifting from the chip 1 address range to the chip 2 address range. This made me wonder if the problem really wasn't in chip one somehow. So I changed it to skip from chip one to the chip four address range. It just skipped chips two and three address range in the middle there. And I got the same error report for the first few addresses on chip four. So it looks like chip one is staying enabled for a few microseconds after the enable line is raised and it is messing up the reads and writes to the other chip that should be addressed instead of chip one. So that's an interesting failure and it's a case where a simple test isn't giving you all the information that you need. Here we have module number three so let's give it a test. Let's see what our handy tester here says. Well so far so good. Our simple fill tests are passing. And 
the walk test even passed. And I can set this for 10 repetitions or 20 and it'll pass every time. But this module does have a problem, but we're not able to show it with this tester. I'll pop up some scope traces here and we'll find out why. What we have here is a capture of address line 10 on this third bad RAM module. And you notice how rounded the edges are. This is abnormal. What it should look like is these nice square edges. This causes incorrect readings and it affects every address range in which A10 is used. And I don't have a good way of determining which chip is bad or maybe it's something on the module substrate itself. So what one could do is pull off one RAM chip at a time from the module and retest A10 to see if the problem persists and then try to test each RAM chip individually as it's pulled off. And maybe you'll get lucky and get it on the first shot and maybe you'll have to pull off three chips to find it. You might notice we have mismatched RAM chips here. This module is the first one that we tested and I pulled this chip off of the second one we tested, one of the good chips, and soldered on here and it actually works. But I have to say, trying to rework these ceramic modules is a real pain. The ceramic is a very, very good heat conductor and it just soaks all the heat away from the solder joints. I had to try to use a hot air gun and soldering iron at the same time and you know keep the board preheated while trying to solder and it was very difficult and it took me a couple tries to get it to work and while I was at it the chip that's here on the bottom this one under here came loose and shifted just a tiny bit but it's still connected good enough to work I think if you really wanted to rework these modules um, you would need to rig up a preheater and a way to hold the chips on the other side in place because they don't seem to be glued like I would have expected. But at least it is possible to rework them. Let's go ahead and give this a test now and see how it works. Okay, here we go. We'll go ahead and give this guy a test and we'll just do one rep. I've tested this about, oh, a hundred times, I would guess, after uh, swapping that chip out as I was working on the software some more. I am fairly certain that it is fixed. And who knows how long it'll stay that way, but at least it's fixed for now. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this episode, learning how to make our little static RAM module tester. Now, I tried to design this project so it would be kind of applicable to other testing ideas that you might have for other vintage chips. Now, all the documentation, the software, the schematics, and that type of thing are in a link in the description down below. It's all on my GitHub. You can go download it and build your own and make all the modifications to your heart's content. It's really handy being able to alter the software on the fly to look for different types of failures that you may not have thought of originally. I'm able to keep doing neat projects like this and bringing them to you in these videos thanks to the support of people on Patreon and by other means. And I really appreciate it. It's what keeps this channel going. If you'd like to find out some information about becoming a supporting member of the Hey Burt channel, just look in the description down below for some links. While you're down there, look for that subscribe button and click it so you'll be subscribed to the channel. Then you'll see a bell-shaped icon. Well, if you click on him, YouTube will be nice enough to let you know just as soon as I post a new video. If you have any questions or comments, I would love to hear from you. Just leave them in the comments section down below. And until next time, bye.